Heroes of the Dorm! Other teams just don't have the chemistry that we have. You really have to like be in sync with your team and know what everyone's doing. I don't want to just win the region, I want to win the tournament. Hello and welcome to Heroes of the Dorm Atlantic Coast Region, a new and exciting addition to North America's premier collegiate gaming competition, where teams from across the United States and Canada are competing for their shot to win fully paid college tuition. All by playing a video game, Heroes of the Storm by Blizzard Entertainment. It's pretty exciting stuff. Absolutely. This is a show where we'll be chronicling the journey of teams that you know and love from colleges all along the Atlantic coast. We'll be going behind the scenes to interview some of the players to find out what it means to be a competitor in this online gaming competition. This is now the fourth year Heroes of the Dorm has been running, and there's nothing more exciting than competing for over $500,000 in scholarships and prizes. Trust me, when I went to school, if my parents knew about this, they would have been installing the game for me. My name is Albert Haloran Haley III. And I am Paul and Verum Todkill, and we'll be your hosts, but we're not alone. We're going to be joined by Braun the Source Mitchell, the professor, as we like to call him, with his notebook of infinite knowledge, pulling out all of the amazing stats for you this year. It's going to be pretty awesome. Hearing about all the deep insights into these teams, hearing their stories particularly, is always super exciting. And of course, we have to take a look at the stats. This is week number two, so let's hop on over and see how our teams are doing. Now, if we take a look up near the top, FSU Crab Legs from Florida State. We talked about them last week, got a chance to sit down and speak with them, hear their thoughts. They are near the top of the pack, doing pretty well. That leg up on the competition that we talked about. But this week, we're looking at Virginia Tech and Clemson. We've got a chance to sit down and talk with Clemson quite a bit, hear their stories, and it's, a, it's pretty cool. They're a young team over there, but they're doing a lot of great stuff. We have a really cool program for you today. Like I said, we're going to be talking to Bobby Burnside over at Clemson. He's heading up their eSports department, talking to Tiger Storm, and hearing about their thoughts in this upcoming matchup on Heroes of the Dorm, Atlantic Coast Region, when we return. Hello and welcome back to Heroes of the Dorm, Atlantic Coast Region. Next up, let's meet Bobby Burnside, the eSports president and something of a pioneer over at Clemson University. Well, Clemson football has basically put Clemson on the map, I would say. Clemson was always my number one choice. I grew up going to Clemson football games. My sister went to Clemson, graduated, so I've always been around here and in the environment. Most of my best friends went to Clemson. It's family. We meet up with all our friends. I usually come up on Thursday, meet with the boys on Friday. And it's 80 something thousand people in a little teeny, teeny town. The atmosphere, which is just, it's not like anything I've ever experienced anywhere in my life. It's so much tradition and the tailgating and the tiger walk and the hill and all of it is just incredible. We live and breathe Clemson football. And for Robert having a, a sister who went here, he was exposed to Clemson you know, all the football games and the whole culture, and he loved it, it's just a natural fit. A lot of people think we don't use this slide, that was just a gimmick, but no, we use this slide multiple times a day. Well, when I first met Robert, uh, one of our other coaches recommended him to me. He told him he's, he's really good with computers and stuff, was kind of like what his, his uh, phrase was. He came highly recommended from coach. I love being able to do that. So this is the video command center. This is basically where I spend all my time. So my day to day is basically uploading all the practice footage into our system. So I'll go through the footage and label it and upload it so that means the coaches and players can see what it is and just easily distribute it to everyone. I love it because he's grown so much being a part of the football team. And you know, he's there and he's editing every bit of the footage that's shot during practice and responsible for all the coaches' laptops, which of course he loves. And they're walking in and grabbing those laptops and, you know, Dabo's included. So pretty, pretty important job. He loves it. It's crazy for me to think about that all of, like the players and coaches, the footage they look at is like the stuff that I've worked with. Like Coach Sweeney's looking at footage that I uploaded. That's I still haven't gotten used to that yet. He kind of has an inside knowledge of what's going on, too, which is kind of fun for us. My husband's probably the biggest Clemson fan that ever lived. So this is his dream, you know. We sit in his tickets now instead of mine because you know, they're better tickets. So it's, it's a blast that, that we can share that, that bond.
He was a very artistic, inquisitive um, child, and he, um, he loved to draw, and we saw definitely a creative side of him from the beginning, very smart and um, always trying to figure things out. It all started with his sister. She got a GameCube, I think it was, and he was six, and he could beat his sister, who's five years older, like in a week, and um, that was it. That's how it all started for him the football players in the neighborhood and the basketball players in the neighborhood loved to watch Robert game and they would all <laughs> line up and we would go upstairs and they're just watching him play it was kind of it was amazing I feel like stereotype is just you're sitting alone in your room you know like Cheetos Mountain Dew just you know just mindlessly playing but I don't think a lot of people realize that how much like mentality and mindset goes into it that is not stereotypical like Robert's friends they are brilliant so I met a bunch of them at the beach and back in my day when we went to the beach we'd roll up in the cars and unload 20 cases of beer right no lie these kids pull up and they start bringing in computer after computer after monitor so I think we took out all the power grids at the beach that week with all their computers set up because I had so many parents that would say you know aren't you concerned that he's playing games all the time and I, I wanted to support Robert in whatever he wanted to do, and he loved gaming. I did not think that I was going to get that big into esports, and I didn't realize that esports was so big even at a college level. Like, I didn't know we had an esports club before I applied to Clemson. Hey guys, we're giving away a Tespa hoodie next. So I'll just show you what it looks like. They're actually pretty nice. So I'm the president of our esports club, so I basically oversee all of the club aspects and help you know recruit new players, host events, basically get teams formed. So NVIDIA and Tespa provide us with a lot of loot, so basically after every game we're giving out prizes to everyone who's coming to watch. Once these games get going, everyone starts getting, getting into it, and it's just like watching a sports game. People cheer for their team, get excited when there's crazy plays. It's, just, it's a great atmosphere. Oh! Here at the dorm is awesome because I feel like it's one of the first legitimized college esports leagues, you could call it. And so it's great to see all these different schools coming out and competing. So it's just like a whole family. So before people were like playing alone in their dorms and we tried to want to bring everyone together and have like a place on campus for them. And he loves the community of esports. That's what it's all about to him. He wants every, the whole industry to grow, not just Clemson's esports, but the whole industry. Professionally, it's grown so much with all these leagues and all these big organizations are getting into it. So I definitely see it more going the traditional sports route where so people are like, oh, I'm watching the basketball game tonight. It's like, oh, well, the HOTS team's playing at 8 o'clock. Let's go watch them. So I feel like it's going to be more widely accepted. When he first started talking to me about eSports, I was sitting there thinking, like, what is, well, I don't honestly know what he's talking about. And then, like I see in the paper the other day that one, there's schools that are giving scholarships for this. And I think all of that is a part of, like, the passion that people have for eSports and, e -ga and gaming in, in general. I feel like that definitely legitimizes it for a lot of people. Like, oh, like my kid's been playing, you know, here's the storm for six hours a day. It's like, well, it actually might turn into something. If they go to college, they get a scholarship for it. I'm telling people like, oh yeah, if you win this, you're getting, you know, a couple thousand or tens of thousands of scholarships. And people just, you know, can't seem to wrap their minds around that. Being able to do something you love and also get a scholarship for it, I think that's an awesome opportunity for people. I hope we can get Clemson Esports on many stages in the future. That's definitely the plan. Well, I have to say, as someone who's been involved in esports for a while, it's fantastic to see the passion that a young guy like Bobby Burnside brings to the table here. Yeah, I was really impressed with the town's overall ability to just have a love and passion for what they do over at their football scene. There's a ton of generational value there as well. Bobby following in the footsteps of his older sister was really cool to see. And, it, and with his experience doing those videos for the football team, he's really setting up the template there do a really good job over on the esports side. Absolutely, taking that passion, the dedication that he brings towards football and bringing over something like esports is not necessarily a pairing that I think a lot of us would expect, but it makes sense. At the end of the day, competition is competition. And if he can, you know, bring that, that drive, you know, that brings to the football team over on the esports side, I think that Clemson will definitely be a school to watch in years to come, especially with the infrastructure that they're putting in towards the football team. If that gets applied to esports, something to watch out for, especially with Tiger Storm, their team competing today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they may not meet, they may not need the locker rooms over there <laughs> on the esports side, but it, fancy computers, things like that, if they can get those set up, that'd be pretty cool. 
Absolutely. And we're going to talk to Tiger Storm when we return. We got a chance to sit down with them when we come back with Heroes of the Dorm Atlantic Coast Region. Hello and welcome back to Heroes of the Dorm Atlantic Coast Region. We've got a chance to sit down with Tiger Storm. They're a young team. Let's see what they have to say. All right, we're in the draft now, and they're gonna be banning first, so let's see what they ban out. I think our strength is generally that we're really good at team fighting together. We're good at communicating with each other what to do in fights. It's fine. Yeah, just turn in, just turn in if you can. Yeah, yeah, we got it. Okay, get ready for web weavers. Communication is essential. Like, if, if you're not communicating well, then you're, you're not gonna have success. Our personality of our teams, I guess kind of casual, but we do work hard, and uh, some of us can get tilted pretty easily than others. Oh yes, <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone gets tilted. Tilting is when you get pissed off. A majority of many things can cause tilting. <sighs> Couldn't fucking frock it. He steps right into it. Hanzo's over here, get Hanzo, get Hanzo. Come, come here, walk to me, walk to me. <sighs> I got stunned by something else. He'll definitely get tilted sometimes if he dies, because in most of his games he doesn't. I have to work extra hard to make sure that he doesn't die. Yeah, um. Yep, I'm dead again. That's game. Generally just people getting, letting their emotions get in the way of the game, and it generally impacts their performance. There's not really a good remedy for it. We just say, okay, we can go next time. Go at him again. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the entire team is fun place overall. It's competitive, but I feel like it's a great uh, community, almost family. You have a bunch of people that you can relate to, and like that's not something I was able to do in the past. And I just love the people in general because like the esports club here is huge. And now I have like everyone here and I've made a bunch of new friends. We are still a young team. And definitely say it makes us underdog doesn't mean we won't have a great showing. Our goal really isn't even that huge right now. It's more so just to play well and to set ourselves up to be really, really successful in the future. I think it'd be great to win, but I think it's I think it's more of the experience. I, I think just competing and doing the best that we can is a focus. But if we do manage to win, then I think that would be awesome. One of the things that every college student ha usually has to do is worry about money, worry about where they're going to live, worry about what they're going to eat, worry about how much school is costing them, how they're going to pay it back. And just having that burden relieved is going to be huge for anyone that gets a scholarship money, much less us. I don't even think it's just about the money we would earn from it. I think it would help prove to like, most colleges that this is a viable option to put money into and to fund even more esports teams in colleges. Tiger Storm. They're a bunch of young guys, but you know what? I think they have some potential. I agree. One thing they have going for them is that they don't have a lot of experience. So what they're going to be able to do is bring an unpredictable element to all the opponents that they find, at least through the regular season. They also have a lot of gumption. It seems like they really care about each other, and I think they could do really well here. Absolutely. And taking a look at these standings one more time, they are right in the middle of the pack again. So it's going to be interesting to see how they do here because this matchup has a lot of repercussions. And as we talked about it before, momentum is super important here. If they win this, they could carry them far. I, I agree. They're going up against Virginia Tech here, a team that does have a lot of experience, so this would be a really good opportunity to see how far they'll go in a region. I think if they do well here, they'll at least show up in the top half of the Atlantic Coast region. Well, let's see. We've done a lot of talking. It's time to play some games. When we return, The Source is going to be joining us for our matchup here. Virginia Tech, Clemson, and Heroes of the Dorm, Atlantic Coast region. Don't go anywhere. We're in McAdams Hall on Clemson campus, and we are going to be playing Virginia Tech in today's test match for the Atlantic Coast region. Uh, mouse pads, ma mice, generally just because of accuracy, uh, and getting their headsets as well. And an Ethernet um, cable, so we have better connections. And then Avery Dragon is a whole PC, so yeah. We feel like nerds. We feel like nerds. It's not so good when your grandma asks you to fix your phone, but it's pretty good when people just call you out in the street. Hey, nerds. Before a competition, generally we like to give up and get together and discuss strategy, look over some tapes, and try to improve in that time. 
We're very good at fighting together, I'd say. We're pretty good at generally meshing together and playing fights well. The issue is going to be rotating too correctly and um, making sure everyone's in the right position at the right time to jump on an objective. All right, guys, we're gonna make sure we draft a lot of wave clear because we're playing Kurt, um, we're playing Spider Queen, and make sure we get a good front line, okay? Three, two, one, go, go Tigers! Tigers! Welcome back to Heroes of the Dorm Atlantic Coast Region. It's game time. Virginia Tech up against Clemson. My name is Inverum, joined by Halorn and the source on the desk. Going to be bringing us all the epic stats. I, I expect big things. The notebook is back. The notebook is back. It's full of numbers. Uh, we'll find out what all of them are. I've spent a lot of time trying to learn about a lot of these players, and plenty of them are new, so the information is hard to find. It's going to be exciting to see how this matchup unfolds. We have the new players versus a little bit more of the veteran squad. It's going to be interesting. I have I have good expectations for Clemson, though. I think it's going to be a really interesting matchup because, like you said, it is going to be experience versus newcomers. Experience means that we might say something we're more familiar with here on the desk. Meanwhile, Clemson could come up with something we've never seen before. Absolutely. We're talking about these players, so let's take a look at these team rosters here and see exactly who is going to be bringing it to the Nexus today. We're starting here with Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech, I, I had a chance to look over this team. They have a lot of experience. Two of the players have been playing since 2015. So taking a look across the aisle at their opponents, we have Tiger Storm from Clemson University. We had a chance to sit down and talk with these guys earlier, so they're a little bit more of a familiar face to us. We talk about the roles in Heroes of the Storm. This is pretty important because we break down our characters into a few different roles. We can actually talk about those a little bit more now. So we'll start off with the assassin role. This is high damage dealing. These are the types of characters who are your carries. These are the people who make the massive plays for you and usually the ones either cleaning up a team fight or opening it up with the damage. Then there's my favorite. I like to play the Warriors almost all the time. They like to lead the charge in the battle. They normally have the highest health pools. They like to set up big plays for those assassins and then take some of the damage for them as well. Absolutely, and looking at the supports as well, they're all about healing. They're about keeping those warriors and those assassins alive and allowing them to do their jobs. The supports are all about enabling their teammates. And lastly, we have the specialists, and they kind of fit pretty much all of the other possible scenarios you can think of. You've got pushing, you've got sort of pseudo supports, you've also got a couple of other interesting mechanics, maybe stopping minions cold the Sylvanas, or being able to siege other lanes as Asmodan. So we've taken a look at these drafts, we've looked at these teams, but now it's time to talk about the battleground. We're gonna be on Tomb with the Spider Queen. It's a small three lane matchup with a fairly simple objective. The source, take it away. So on this map, you're going to be turning in a series of gems that you get off of killing spider minions, and you're gonna use those to summon large spiders, the web weavers, to push down the lanes and help you push the objective. What makes it difficult is turning those gems in. Any bit of interruption from your opponent, if they throw a pebble at you or poke you with a stick even, <laughs> that is going to stop that turn in, and it becomes difficult to be able to defend that and make that uh, you know, your prime objective. Personally, this is one of my favorite battlegrounds because it invites a lot of action early on in the game. A hero like Diablo, someone likes to shadow charge and go in on someone that's out of position could do very well here. Clemson University definitely took the right hero for this battleground. Absolutely. Capitalizing on these small confined spaces means action from the first minute from the get-go. It's one of the reasons I also love this battleground. So we're going to be getting right into it with our first matchup, Virginia Tech up against Clemson. Let's do it. Over on the left side, we have Virginia Tech. It's going to be Tim for Virginia Tech playing Hanzo. DTI 12 is on Anna. Dr. D is playing Tyrion, not Andrew. We'll be sliding on in ETC. And Jack V1 is on green. Yep, and over on the red side, we've got the members of Clemson Tiger Storm. Jake is good 13 on the Diablo, ZB Skeleton on the Kael'thas, Mayan Ryan on the Blaze, NLG Brown Man on Uther, and her Kanan is going to be on that Genji. Early on to start this game, looks like there's going to be a good amount of action in the middle. Note that Blaze is going down to the bottom for Clemson. So they have something else up their sleeve. Not Andrews hanging out in the bush, seeing if he can catch somebody out of position. Yeah, and on Tube and the Spider Queen, it's one of our maps that has a dedicated solo lane. Sometimes there are a couple of rotation options. You can rotate mid lane to top lane or mid lane to bottom. 
and set up a solo lane in, in either the top or the bottom, but tends to be the bottom as there's an extra mercenary camp that will spawn down there. We'll see the teams rotate between the lanes, picking up the gems, trying to maximize that as much as possible. And by sending my and Ryan down there on the blaze, they already get a little bit of push and it gives them some advantage. And we already have some fighting in the mid. Oh, a nice charge from Jake is good. It's gonna isolate, not Andrew. The follow-up damage from Hurricane Nine's almost enough to get the first takedown in the game. But ETC gonna be able to escape. Yeah, an impressive maneuvering and healing um, coming out from uh, the Ana on D DTI 12. Ugh, that one's gonna take me a little <laughs> while. Um, and it's difficult because the Ana has to land that healing as a skill shot because it's not as conventional healing as you'd normally expect. They're already putting a lot of pressure on the not Andrew. I really like Hurricane Nine's play so far. He's putting continuous harassment on ETC. It's making it really hard for not Andrew to establish some kind of offensive in this early part of the game. Down in the bottom lane, looks like Mayan Ryan's putting the screws to Dr. D on Tyrio. He's not really known for his solo laning prowess, so Tyrio's gonna have, str have a struggle now. Yeah, it's always been a challenge, especially with the new upgrades to Tyrio with his um, changes in the most recent patch. He's much better when he's grouped. He's able to put a shield onto all of those minions. He has taken that level one talent. And so it makes him better in the rotation, but they may just feel that Dr. D is their best solo laner. It's also giving space for Jack V1 to be able to go and start up that early mercenary camp. What we're seeing here is a more disciplined approach to this battleground. Sometimes we see four-man groups going around looking for those takedowns early. But it looks like both teams just resigned to making sure they're catching as much experience as possible. If they see an opportunity, it looks like they're poised to take it. But right now, they're just playing it safe. Yep, gem count has been pretty even across the board. Both teams have been collecting what they've been able to get. Uh, not a lot of turn in, only five for the side of Clemson. So they're taking it slow, taking some time to build that up. But with this mercenary camp here in the middle lane, this night camp, it gives them some spell resistance. So all of those abilities they would normally use to clear out the minions are reduced because of that one spellcaster minion. You see that aura, that light circle on the ground. They're now gonna try and take him out. Once he dies, that circle goes away. But until they did, it made it harder for them to push down that opposing minion wave. And this is something that a more passive beginning to a game will enable for a team that has the presence of mind to go over and get that bruiser camp. Thankfully, Clemson was able to defend that very well, so they didn't lose too much on structures. But up in the top lane, the towers took a bit of damage. Yeah, the more early sieging you can get done on a map like Tomb of the Spider Queen, the better. Any of these maps with direct pushing mechanics, such as these web weavers, the damage is permanent, and that damage will eventually net you experience. It also makes it so when you do eventually turn in that web weaver wave, that web weaver will get further and further towards your opponent's nexus. It's going to be really interesting Interesting to see how these teams prioritize going for the turn-ins. It's going to be a lot of control you need to have on the map to be able to complete that channel. Like you said, if you get poked with a stick, you're going to have a bad time. But Jack version 1 is going to put some damage on the Mayan Ryan and help out Tyrell in the bottom. Yeah, it's difficult to be able to put a lot of pressure on the Blaze, but we already see that defense on the turn in. Not Andrew was looking to be able to deposit those gems and it only took one ability and it was from the support. Brown Man didn't do a lot of damage uh, with with that Uther spell. It you know isn't meant to be able to hurt him much. It's just meant to be able to slow him down, stop him from doing what he wants to do. He's even picked up the, uh, the Burning Rage. He's got that flame aura around him. So he just needs to walk near him now to be able to interrupt. It's going to be that much more difficult to get the first set of web weavers, but Jake is going to be able to turn in 14, it looks like, at this rate. Down in the bottom lane, Dr. D and Jack teamed up to get that siege camp if that's left to its own devices. That couldn't get some value. A nice gravity lapse from ZB Skelton. Does some damage to not Andrew. He's trying to wrap around the corner, but DT with these snipes from Anna is on point. Yeah, DT is keeping a good eye on not Andrew, seeing how much the side of Clemson has been prioritizing him, how much pressure they've been looking to put on. And because they rotated two members into that bottom lane to get that mercenary value, they ended up giving up some of the turn in pressure. Now it is 19 to 19, but the first turn in can be very crucial depending on when it happens. This is Heroes of the Storm, they have team levels. Hitting of the right talent tier, especially with this level seven, means that if you get a lot of value and a lot of structures off of that first web weaver turn in, you can then get to your heroics at level 10 and be able to continue to pressure the opposing team. Levels are something that's very important to Heroes of the Storm. Both teams now round level seven, so they get another talent. One thing that I'm looking forward to seeing is how Jake handles Diablo. Level seven, he took the Diabolical Momentum, which means he'll be able to shadow charge and do those flips a bit more often. Yeah, looking to add in the increased crowd control. And it also is a very uh, squishy backline. Um, the, the members of 
the side of Virginia Tech, their more vulnerable characters have very low health pools. They have they have a nice front line, but Anna's not very mobile. Hanzo is only mobile when he's near a wall and can use his passive to get away. And Greymane is only as mobile as the player is good at the character. So it becomes difficult if the members from Clemson get in the back line that Diablo can wreak a lot of havoc. Another thing is, the slower this game goes at the beginning, the more souls you'll be able to stack, which means his health pool will be that much higher. Shadow Charge goes in on the Jack. Greyman could be caught in a tough spot. He uses his fancy footwork to jump into the top lane and makes a daring escape. Uh, we should just There's push uh, just push all the lanes. Just try to get walls down right go now. For the takedown, but they decided not to. They are going to be able to... We just want to try to get a level 10s and fight that. To ...sneak in there, get away from Tyrael, and be able to turn him without being interrupted. Here comes the first Web Weaver wave. It is close to level 8. So we could see a mid Web Weaver team fight happen around that uh, that level 10 power spike, depending on where the teams decide to prioritize. If the members of Clemson can get down two walls, they should hit that amount of experience. This is Clemson's opportunity to do some damage to these structures. They haven't gone for any other camps otherwise, so this is going to be a big moment. Brown Man's leading the charge with Zeke and Skelton in the mid lane, leaving just Tim for Virginia Tech here in the middle. Trying to defend, Hanzo's not exactly known for his wave clear in some instances, but he's doing pretty good right now. Yeah, it takes him a couple of talents to be able to do that. He's just going to look to put pressure onto whichever targets get close so that Jake is good can't do a whole lot. They don't want him diving past the Web Weaver and picking somebody out of the composition, but they've gotten those two guaranteed walls. They are basically at level 10, they'll get it off of a minion or two. Now the heroics are in play, and this could be huge. There is still uh, an opportunity for them to find a fight, and they may have found the Anna. DT could be in a tough spot. The sleep will allow Anna to slide on out of there. Look at the Tylenol Hall PM. It's going to allow them to escape. <laughs> Heroic's not yet on the board, however, for Virginia Tech, so this is definitely very much still a power play for Clemson. Yeah, Clemson is at a clear advantage here, and even though... Uh, level 10 is very close to Virginia Tech. They need to be careful about this timing. If they get engaged on before they get those heroics, this could be a huge team fight opportunity and could snowball. Jack's low on health, has to back away. Tim for Virginia Tech, also pretty low. But here's Anna back again, landing those snipes to patch their teammates back up. Jake is good up in the top, just making sure this pressure in the top lane is steady and consistent. With 17 gems in his pockets, that could be another path towards a second set of web weavers. Yes. And Defending against your opponent getting their first web weaver and being able to uh, oppress them because you were able to get those heroic abilities versus a common strategy. You basically get the first web weaver and you never let your opponent ever turn in because it is difficult. Uh, you know, there's plenty of opportunities to interrupt them. And losing all of those gems, every time you die, every time you lose a member of your team, yes, they're going to respawn and come back, but those gems will drop. Unless you can have somebody walk over and secure them, you lose them permanently. And we see the members of Virginia Tech are being consistently pressured out, and there's already almost another turn in for the side of Clemson. They've shown that they can get a decent amount of value on the first one. They're going to need to get a lot on the second, but it seems good for them so far. There goes Shadow Charge in from Jake, trying to do some damage. There's a stun on the Jack. He's put on a weird spot. Gets low, but actually it's Kalthas who's go for launch with the first takedown. Greyman ultimately does go down, however. Not Andrew, could be next on the chopping block. The suplex in the Shadow Charge does exactly that. Two heroes down inside of Virginia Tech, and Harry Canine's looking for more. Yeah, he got a good amount of value there. It was a late... Uh, apocalypse from the Diablo, but at the end of the day, they were able to secure the turn on the side of Clemson. A lot of gems were lost for the members of Virginia Tech, and that's going to set them back a bit. Tyrael is sitting on a nice bank down in the bottom. Dr. D is, you know, keeping everything locked down here, but he would want to be with the team. Sanctification, the heroic from Tyrael is a great team fight uh, heroic. Oh. Ooh, <laughs> goodbye. Oh, no, that's just not fair. Hurricane 9 didn't want the decaf that time. He's like, all right, you put me to sleep before, but this time it's definitely going to be the fourth takedown for Clemson. With the Web Weaver showing up, two heroes down, this is definitely a huge opportunity. Two members, no, three actually in the top lane looking to do damage. They could do something free deep. They should be able to easily get this fort. And now the members of Clemson are starting to push their advantage pretty far. Virginia Tech has been getting picked off individually. They have a low mobility composition with the exception of some very specific scenarios. So the members of Clemson are just abusing that. Every time they see them, they're checking them and seeing if there's an opportunity to make something happen. Diablo is using that shadow charge pretty much off cooldown. Anytime he sees somebody, he's like, can I make this happen? And he's got teammates there close enough to back him up if he gets an opportunity. 
two big things I'm seeing here so far, Source, is look at DT's health bar. As low as it gets, that means the team fight capability for Virginia Tech pretty much goes out the window. Because Tyrael committing to the bottom lane, he has that heroic sanctification, which means anyone in a circle takes no damage. Without those two forms of sustain, Clemson's really starting to get ahead with these poke wars. Yeah, they're fighting without their guardian angel. He's basically bringing, you know, bringing down the heavens to save them, and he can't be with the team piece. They've committed him to defending that bottom lane. Maybe that's a compositional issue. Maybe they could have changed up their rotations and prepared for what Blaze could have done. Because Blaze is this, uh, you know, this, this walking flamethrower. All he's going <laughs> to do is push down waves and get in your way and, you know, put down damage onto the structures. Maybe there was an option there, but they still have space for a team fight. They're close to their level 13 talent tier. That'll give them a good fighting chance to fight back. They have more than enough gems to be able to turn in if they open things up, and they only need a few to, uh, few to make, be able to start making a comeback. Forget bringing down the heavens. The only thing Tyr has been able to do is bring the broom to the bottom lane, which how much he's stuck soaking experience down there. But he is back now. Both teams do have their level 13 talent, so this could be a huge momentum swing back in favor of the blue team. Jake goes in, could puts himself on an island. Potentially, he is going to be able to back away. Mayan Ryan goes for the charge, just misses that. There's the double sleep for mana. DT's done a really good job landing him so far. Yeah, and Dr. D was sneaking the turn in, so that was good for them. They didn't hard engage on the side of Virginia Tech. They saw once Jake is good went in, the moment that the uh, Shockwave knocked him back, the moment the face melt from ETC was able to stop that, they just stopped. They didn't go anywhere. They didn't even risk trying to reset up the fight. Now they've got the Web Weavers. They do need to fight soon though. The level 16 talent here is coming, clo is getting closer for the side of Clemson. So they probably want to fight before that happens or they're going to be looking at a massive disadvantage. But they have a little bit of breathing room. I definitely agree. They want to try to make something happen now, but something we haven't seen yet so far is Diablo's use of his heroic apocalypse, which could potentially stun anyone caught standing in a similar spot for a, long, for a second or longer. With that on the board, it's going to be pretty tough to push in here, but the overpower goes in. Ooh, Shadow charge as well. A nice arrow from downtown into a huge mosh pickup spell. Big opportunities for the team in blue. Brown man, low on health, trying to back away. Jack B1 trying to get the takedown in that team fight. Has to back out himself. Hurricane 9 brings out the Gensu knife can't find Gray Man, and now he has to escape himself. Oh, man. Wait, no, it's not over. Not Andrew slides in again. Brown Man, Jake, low on health as well. Skelton's like, I don't know if I can do anything for you, buddy. Skelton's going to have to start to back away there. 31 gems in the pockets of Jake. He has no choice but to forfeit that top fort. They cannot afford to lose those gems. What is Hurricanean doing? <laughs> playing with playing with fire, a dance with the devil. The Dreadlord returns, and as Jake is good, was considering going back in for that. That was the fight that Virginia Tech needed, and it might not be over. Extended fight, they're starting up this boss. They need to be careful, Dr. D's in trouble. They have the tier advantage, so they're like, why not roll the dice? Power slide goes in on Diablo and two other members. Clemson could be in a tough spot, potentially. The bunker is gonna drop. Kale Thoughts is gonna hit the deck as well. DT out on and a low on health. Mayan Ryan is gonna be able to close that takedown out. Tim for Virginia Tech, trying to wrap around the corner. Hits the jump, has the moves to nail and escape. Ooh, they need to get out of there. Arrow is back. This is the most extended team fight I have seen in a while. Hurricane will try and get himself out of there, but he should be hunted down. And now Jake is good as left. Tons of gems have been dropped, but none of them by the side of Virginia Tech. They've only lost one member over the course of that entire team fight. I don't think that went the way they thought it was going to go. Losing three no. arrows out of that progression when you have a tier advantage. It's something that happens when you try to get a little bit too ambitious. It does pave the way for another set of web weavers to show up here for Virginia Tech. I really got to commend Tim for Virginia Tech's ability to jump over that wall, keep himself alive, and turn around with that dragon arrow. That was huge, sir. So a couple, a couple of interesting things happened there. One, that was perfect team fight time. It was happening around level 16, but level 16 hadn't been picked up. It was an inopportune team fight for the side of Clemson. They weren't really ready for it. It was a good initiation from the side of Virginia Tech. Everything kind of set up for them. And then Genji went too far. They got the three-man mosh off of the arrow. So many things lined up for them that they were able to slow play that fight. And it let Anna heal for an extended period of time. And she, she didn't have to worry about healing everybody. She was able to t focus on one target at a time because of great spacing by Virginia Tech. They spread themselves out and they forced their opponents to get out of position. This is something that you can see from a newer team like Clemson University. If they are able to coordinate their heroics and get that engage that they're looking for, 
They could definitely get the upper hand in these team fights. Jake is going to shadow charge in with 42 gems. If he goes down, that's going to be a lot in the line. A nice stun in a two-person mosh pit. Is the damage going to be there? The dragon arrow follows up. Genji waves goodbye. Pressure hits put on his top keep. Brown man's trying to step forward. Jack's going to be able to back away right now. This is definitely a power play for Vegeta Tech. Some brutal, some brutal brotherly love from Hanzo to Genji. Now the members of Virginia Tech, they can choose to siege again. They've already used two turn-ins, so they kind of need to slow it down a little bit. Maybe go for the boss. And just hey, whenever you see TC slide on me, just APOC. I don't have APOC up now. I, I'm but, not right now, but like I'm saying just in general. Yeah. Well, I just couldn't react in time because I got stunned while he did that. Like, don't wait for his animation. Just whenever he slides in onto me. Well, no, I guess he slides onto me too. So. Structure value, they've gotten some of those walls, and now there's a turn in for the side of Clemson. This will kind of negate the value of this boss because the members of Virginia Tech will have to worry about the other lanes being pushed out, and their boss is going to pretty much be stopped because they have to go deal with the, the rest of the map. This is an interesting neutralizing gesture here from Clemson University because, like you said, the Web Weavers up top is going to be able to clear out this boss with relative ease. But other than that, it's largely a defensive gesture. Normally, you want to pick these Web Weavers up to try to do damage on the other side of the map, but they're well ahead in structures right now, so this is just going to kind of even things out in the race to level 20. Yeah, this is this is a it, it's a solid a solid stalling tactic from Clemson after how badly those last few engagements have gone for them. They can kind of take some time, regroup themselves. They don't have to worry about too much. They also still have a, a couple of gems in in the bank to be able to turn in. It's not a massive amount, but they're not completely broken that capacity. On the other side, the members of Virginia Tech they're starting to build up close to that third turn in, and they've done a good job of capitalizing on their turn in so far. This is a slightly dangerous position for them, but blazes a little far out so they won't be getting engaged on just yet. Yeah, they're mount up and they're going to be able to get out of there. This is another instance where we see some of the veteran experience of Virginia Tech come to fruition. They're going to go ahead and let the Web Weaver just die alone up top and get some pressure down in the bot lane. They could have potentially tried to push with the boss, make something happen, but what we're seeing is a team that's thinking two or three steps ahead. Yeah, they're willing to kind of slow play this till they see an opportunity. Uh, the arrows coming out from Hanzo have been very good, great uh, Great placement and timing on them. It's a new heroic, it's a new hero. He's only been around for a little while. His, his, his showing competitive play has been uh, impressive, but they're, they've done a good job of learning how to time out when they want that initiation to happen. Because normally, your initiation comes from your warrior players. It comes from your tanks. The people in the front line are deciding when they want to dive. This is a go button from the back line. So it's, you know, it takes a little bit more coordination. It's not something you expect to see on the other side. You see that arrow come from off screen, your eyes jump out of your skull pretty much. And we saw exactly that after that nice mosh pit up in the top lane. Glimpse is going to go ahead and pick up their bruiser camp. The bruiser camp was also snapped up, however, for Virginia Tech. The blue team finds themselves slightly ahead in experience, and once they get level 20, that could be a huge opportunity. Yeah, timing 20 with a web weaver wave could be a, the death march for them. That could be the opportunity for them to be able to win the game. Okay, got played. That was a bad ult. It's, it's short cooldown. It's fine. Yeah, it actually has a really short cooldown. Okay. We should soak top. We need to soak top. They're going to get 20 soon. And they have to defend the camp. Well, they're playing mid. Should, we, need to, uh, we need to answer this uh, before they get 20s. Uh, they, they get, we need to just wait. We just don't fight. Just don't fight. Yeah. We need to they're gonna have a rose. Ability options to speak of there. This could have blown the game wide open for Clemson. Nice defense there from Virginia. Yeah, that gives them a little that gives them a little bit of time uh, on the side of Clemson to move around the map and clear out a couple more minions, but they would have really loved that pick. That pick would have guaranteed them the time to get to 20. Uh, they've just gotten a turn in, but now the members of Virginia Tech are here. They're looking for an opportunity, and ooh, they almost caught that kill boss. This is an interesting time for Clemson University. The onus was on them in a lot of ways to try to make something happen before level 20, but they also don't have enough to get a, a turn in now. They're not going to be able to get another set of web weavers. Meanwhile, 70 gems are in the pockets for Virginia Tech. That means they should be able to get this turn in up top. Clemson's going to be in a tough spot. They're going to try to defend this without their storm to attempt. They can poke. They do have the ability to be able to harass this down a little bit. I thought it was dangerous that they were stepping up with, uh, with the blaze in bottom. Uh, he should have shown, but the arrow was still down, so they couldn't engage. There wasn't the opportunity there. So Clemson knew their limits. Genji, he takes a, uh, a swipe, swipe across the nose, and then he'll walk away from it. But that is a half health bar carry. He needs to be careful. 
If you were looking for a definition of poke, seeing Hurricane Nine's health bar go down to about half in the blink of an eye is a perfect example of that. But the blue web weavers are gonna get turned in. Jake tries to go in, eats a lot of damage, and gets taken down immediately after. And on the flank, low on health, Bunker is gonna go down. That's a nice take. That's gonna take the health pool for Diablo right out of the approach. Yeah, he will be back up, has now used all of his souls in his passive. He collected those and is now able to revive, but nobody picked up his gems. So that's a good chunk of gems lost after this web we return, and we'll see what the damage actually was. But that is not good for the side of Clemson. They didn't want to lose their Diablo early, and now he's not going to have as big of a health bar. He's now lost some effective health going into some of these team fights. Although he is on the flank, this could be a good position for him. If he finds the support, he goes in. There's the long range dragon arrow, which is going to air ball. Not Andrew is isolated for the moment, tries to get around a corner. We see a lot of low health bars, though, on the side of Clemson. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to go in and try to defend this middle fort. This late in the game, I'd much rather sacrifice this fort than to lose heroes. Yeah, health bars traded, but things look a little bit better there for Virginia Tech. That was a good sleep dart. Sleep dart follow-up combo between Hanzo and Anna. I actually really like that. That's some very good guaranteed poke. Uh, you know, ooh, actually, that's going to be a... Uh, uh, fort going down, or I uh, keep going down, my mistake, and uh, that opens up a lot for them. So just that that stall out, that the timing on that fight opened things up for Virginia Tech. And that scrap in the mid lane proved to be Jazz Hands ultimately for the Blue Web Weaver to get that <laughs> top keep. That means catapults are going to be in the top lane for the rest Ooh, of the game, timing, which though. is a huge offense advantage for Virginia Tech. But right now, shh, source. They're hanging out in the bush. They're waiting to strike. If someone rotates up there, they could definitely slide out with ETC, blow somebody up, and end this game. Be very, very quiet. We're hunting end game objectives. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be able to take this boss. So, like I said before, softening up that top lane was good for them. And the members of Clemson, they know that this is the answer. Not Andrew is going to run right into that Uther. They've already thrown down the Andrew fight so they can holy grind in, and the team fight is on. A bit of miscommunication, though. Jake is isolated, tries to jump in there. He does not have a Oh, that arrow! Oh, no! A huge dragon arrow. Power slide goes out, takes down Uther. He's a ghost for the moment. Mine Ryan isolated with the nice holy ground. He's going to go into the bunker and try to hide out. Can he escape? A lot of damage turns to his way. 14 gems on the floor. Isolated and brought down. They, they might be able to defend this, but it doesn't look good. That's an open core. That's a 22 minute boss. The members of Virginia Tech should be able to follow up onto this. And uh, that arrow, that arrow was perfect with the, with, the, with the face melt. Like that was just beautiful timing, a beautiful angle. And I think the members of Virginia Tech should be able to take this. They get the mosh. A huge mosh pit is definitely going to put an exclamation point on the bottom end of this game. The shield is down, the core down to 92% rapidly falling. Genji and Kael'thas are going to have to have the game in their life to try to turn this around, but it's not going to be enough source. We see Virginia Tech take this game. Ooh, that era. That arrow. <laughs> that arrow, that angle, the boss, everything was perfect. Not that arrow, those arrows. Tim okay, was landing dragon arrows cleanly all game. There were plenty. We're going to hear from Jake from Clemson to get their thoughts on that match. Mainly that was on me. We had the lead early. We ended up just losing it later on, though. So we just need to make sure that we don't do what I essentially did. And I made a mess up in one fight, and that let them get a lead, and they had eventually snowballed from that. I think we're all right. I think we are definitely using these as learning opportunities. We're not expected to. We're not expecting ourselves to go too far in this in this tournament. It's more so we're we're wanting to get a little more learning experience and wanting to get our, ourselves some experience so we can understand and better know the game and produce and have better results in our next one. We can fight this. We can fight this. Yep, I'm dead again. That's game. Yeah, right, nice try, guys. Welcome back to Heroes of the Dorm, Atlantic Coast Region. We've had another awesome episode for you here, taking a look at the team over at Clemson and watching some awesome matches here. But in the end, Virginia Tech ended up taking it home. That being said, we have another awesome episode for you coming your way next week. UNC, we're going to be heading down that way, chatting with them, hearing their stories, and learning more about their adventures in the Nexus and how it all ties together with collegiate esports. That and more next week coming right at you with Heroes of the Dorm, Atlantic Coast Region.